All right, this is going to be airway management and ventilation, and this is going to be part one of six videos in this subject material. And this is going to be a critical care level. So topics we're going to discuss here in this first section are going to be advanced airway management techniques. And as far as the introduction goes, a critical care paramedic must pretty much master any kind of difficult airway that they might come into or encounter. Uh, in their field. Um, the skills videos are going to be in a section. Uh, please review those as well. The tests uh, or your exams will cover that as well. Uh, manual airway maneuvers, which you pretty much should be familiar with. Uh, basic mechanical airways, we'll talk about those and those will be in the skill video section as well. Um, and then uh, advanced airway management, oral tracheal intubation is in there. Surgical crike retrograde and then we have a bougie uh, display in there as well. So take a look at those and those will help greatly with uh, exams. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is pretty much specialized laryngoscope blades and they pretty much attach to the laryngoscope handle and they're pretty much the same as attachment as a Miller or a Mac only they're they're adjusted so that they help you view the glottic opening a little better. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the grand view blade surface is about 80% wider. Um, this is going to help you uh, pretty much people with large tongues or difficult airways this this might get you a better uh, viewpoint of the actual glottic opening. Uh, it has a brighter lamp, uh, provides more light than the standard bulbs, fits pretty much standard laryngoscope handles and there are child sizes available in the grand view. Next one on the list is going to be the ViewMax. Uh, used like a traditional curve blade or a Mac. <clears throat> Has a viewing tube with a patented lens, and this, this lens is kind of um, convex, so it's like one of the mirrors that you'd see in the hospital when turning around corners. Uh, it allows you to get a better view of the actual glottic opening. Uh, even if the airway is anterior, it gives you about another 20% on your viewpoint uh, whenever looking through this scope. Theoretically provides a view from <clears throat> below the epiglottis up to the larynx. And it pretty much fits green spec fiber optic laryngoscope handles. And there are pediatric sizes available. Innovation adjuncts. Um, we're going to, uh, these areas are going to assist you with endotracheal innovation. And they're useful when the glottic opening is visual, or is difficult to visualize. Um, this we do have an example of in the skills video, which is the gum elastic bougie. Uh, it's a semi-rigid stylet and uh, can be used with an endotracheal tubes with an inner diameter of 6.0 or greater. The tip here is bent to about 30 degrees and it's about 3.5 centimeters from the distal end. And what this does is this um, aids in directing the tip under the epiglottis and into the tracheal opening and sliding the tip over the tracheal rings because as we have the tracheal rings here from the side this bougie as we run this in and out of the tracheal opening we're going to feel those cartilaginous rings here so it'll give us kind of a tactile sensation up the bougie so that we can actually feel it um, indications when visualization of the vocal cords is not possible and this is going to be whenever they have a Cormac Lehan grade of three or higher uh, and this is pretty much going to be no visualization of the glottic opening under laryngoscopy. Uh, they have a short thick neck, pregnancy, uh, anatomical variations that we might see, tumors, laryngeal edema, or inability to position the patient properly. And that might be from whatever, from the patient size, from the mouth being too small, very, uh, multiple variations. This would assist us in getting a tube into the glottic opening. Procedure whenever we talk about this and whenever we look at it is whenever we have the laryngoscope in under direct laryngoscopy, the tip of the bougie is orientated anterior to the midline and inserted under the epiglottis into the trachea. So even if we can see a portion of it, what we can do is we can run that bougie into the tracheal cavity and under blind, even blind conditions, the 30 degree angle in that should allow us to feel the tracheocartilaginous rings 
When the bougie is placed in the trachea, the operator should be able to feel the tracheal rings at the distal tip is bounced over the trachea. Uh, continue inserting the bougie until the trachea until resistance is felt. The resistance is probably whenever the tip reaches the carina. And this is typically about 25 to 40 centimeters deep. If no bumps are felt, you're probably in the esophagus, which is this section right here. If the trachea maintains, if in the trachea, maintain laryngoscopy and bougie in place while the assistant threads an endotracheal tube over the bougie into the pharynx. So you're going to use this kind of as a guide wire, and you're going to put the, uh, the ET tube right over the top of the bougie. And if the endotracheal tube impinges on the posterior cartilage, cartilages or the tracheal ring, pretty much rotate the tube counterclockwise. So what you're going to want to do with this is if you hit resistance, pretty much rotate the ET tube around the bougie. And what will happen is, is it will kind of move that beveled tip to where it will work its way past, us, past it. Once, in the, once the endotracheal tube is in place, hold it firmly at the lip, uh, remove the bougie, and inflate the distal cuff and confirm tube placement. Next um, toy on our list is a nasal tracheal tube auscultation device. And what this does is, is a Burton nasoscope, and it's used to pretty much facilitate nasal tracheal intubation. This area here actually attaches to the endotracheal tube, and this goes into your ears like a stethoscope. And what this does is as you insert it into the nair, the, the ET tube, once you get closer to the glottic opening, you'll increase uh, the auditory responses will increase through this device. Uh, Stethoscope-like earpieces allows for auscultation of breath sounds, and the closer you are to it, the better it's going to be. Um, whenever they take a breath, you kind of continue inserting, and generally the patient will suck the tube down into their glottic opening. <clears throat> a Beck Airway Airflow Monitor, or BAM, uh, and this thing is attached to the ET tube, and it pretty much makes a whistle. <clears throat> uh, has a 15 millimeter connector. Audible whistling sound produces as air moves through the tube, and this occurs on inhalation and exhalation. Uh, the louder the whistling occurs, the closer you are to the glottic opening. Uh, placement of trachea, placement in trachea increases the intensity of the whistling. Loss of whistling sound indicates that you're probably in the esophagus. These are just to facilitate a nasal tracheal intubation. And a burp maneuver, um, which means backward, upward, right, word pressure. Um, under laryngoscopy, <clears throat> whenever you have the laryngoscope uh, in the patient's uh, um, epiglottis area and trying to visualize, if you can't quite see the glottic opening, you can have someone perform kind of a uh, modified Silix maneuver, which is pretty much um, you're going to press backward and upward and rightward. And if the if the person under using the laryngoscope come in on the patient's right and they're swooping to the left and looking, you should meet them with this maneuver. This is called a burp maneuver. Uh, this can improve a Cormac Lehan grade two or three by at least one grade. Digital intubation. Um, this is used with your uh, fingers. Now, if you have small hands, this probably isn't going to work. <clears throat> this is a tactile intubation technique, not to be used on a conscious patient or anybody that has a gag reflex. Indications on this are going to be uh, whenever you don't have um, laryngoscopy equipment available. Uh, visualization of the glottic structures are pretty much impossible due to trauma, blood, or vomit in the airway. Anybody that may have a potential cervical spinal injury where you want to keep their uh, their head pretty much in a neutral inline position. Um, poor lighting, patient position is just not quite right. Uh, other situations um, that would make it uh, impossible to intubate under normal means. Uh, rescue airways are unavailable or they failed. Um, so you're going to have to have someone, like I said, with very long fingers or pretty long fingers. Uh, procedure is is to provide 
uh, cervical stabilization by holding onto their head. Uh, and then the intubator would come in from this direction and insert the middle finger to where he could feel the epiglottis. His index finger or pointer finger then would be used to facilitate an intubation by running the endotracheal tube down the side of his middle finger and kind of using the index finger to hook the ET tube up into the glottic opening. Uh, ET confirmation should still be done with capnography, either colorimetric or waveform device, and under normal means by uh, auscultation of the stethoscope. A skyhook technique is used whenever you can't get somebody in the appropriate on their back position. Um, patients is generally in a sitting position, which means they're probably going to be either trapped in a vehicle or sitting in their chair. Um, the intubator should pretty much come in from a superior position on top of them. You're going to insert the laryngeal scope and swoop in the same direction. Um, the actual endotracheal tube, you should put a, um, a stylet down it and have it kind of in the position of a hockey stick or maybe bent just a little bit more. Um, whenever you go ahead and hook them from the front and pull their jaw forward, if there's any kind of trauma, please have someone that's behind the patient providing C-spine stabilization. You're going to look over the bridge of the patient's nose and down towards their glottic opening or their chest cavity. When you see the glottic opening, uh, put the ET tube in place and go through your confirmation techniques. And we just talked through this. Macintosh 3 or 4 is probably the most available. Place in the patient mouth, lifts a hook, lifts or hooks the patient's tongue at a 90 degree angle to the patient's vertical axis. Uh, intubator looks into the patient's airway and visualizes the glottic opening and then inserts the endotracheal tube. A lighted stylet. Um, a transluminal translumination is used to facilitate tracheal intubation. And the cricothyroid membrane is a thinner area, so this lighted area under normal light conditions, whenever it's inserted oh, with an ET tube on it, you should see a lighting effect occur in their uh, anterior tracheal area. Uh, can be performed with or without direct laryngoscopy. Uh, used without laryngoscopy decreases cervical spine manipulation. Conditions that decrease uh, transillumination are going to be bright ambient light, so this probably isn't going to work on outside on a sunny day, or dark pigmentation to the skin, or obesity, and that's because of the amount of real estate or tissue that is in between the trachea and the actual surface of the skin. <clears throat> um, prepare the endotracheal tube on the stylet. Um, Place the patient's supine head in a neutral position, kneel at the patient's side, ensure the patient's neck is exposed, turn on the lighted stylet, non-dominant hand, grasp and lift the patient's jaw and tongue. Keep the stylet tube midline, insert the patient's uh, mouth in advance to the hypopharynx, continue to advance the styleted tube hooking under the epiglottis into the trachea. Observe well-defined circumferential translumination of the patient's anterior neck, and this is where it's going to uh, show you, like on the anterior surface of the neck, that it's kind of thin around the cricothyroid membrane, so you should see illumination. Advance and secure the endotracheal tube. Uh, confirm proper endotracheal tube placement. A retrograde intubation. A retrograde intubation is an intubation that's facilitated pretty much by the use of a guide wire, and it is a combination, kind of, of the bougie technique and um, a crike, a needle crike. So, a translaryngeal facilitated intubation. Guide wires passed retrograde through the cricothyroid cartilage into the oropharynx. Guide wires used as a stylet, and the tube is passed over the wire into the trachea. Useful when direct oral tracheal intubation is impossible. Uh, equipment is going to be a standard central line wire 
or if they have a prepackaged retrograde innovation kit. You're going to essentially position the patient's head with the neck readily accessible and fully exposed. Prepare the anterior neck with provodyne, iodine, or a similar antiseptic solution. Identify your cricothyroid cartilage. Use a large bore needle attached to a syringe. Uh, one to two centimeters of nor one to two cc's of normal saline would be preferred to be in the syringe. As you advance the needle towards the head, the patient's head, into the tracheal lumen. Instead of now, whenever we would normally do a cricothyroid um, airway we would actually aim, aim the needle towards the patient's feet. In this case here, we're going to aim it actually towards their head. <clears throat> we're going to confirm tracheal placement of the needle tip by aspirating air and observing bubbles in the syringe. So if we're in the tissue, we're not going to be able to get bubbles. If we're actually in the tracheal opening due to the cartilaginous rings, bubbles are going to form up into the 10 mil syringe. When firmly securing the needle in place, remove the syringe and needle from the hub. So we're going to actually leave the uh, catheter of this, per preferably a 14 gauge, in place. Insert the guide wire into the trachea through the needle and advance the wire into the pharynx. And now while we have the, the guide wire that hopefully entered into the upper oropharynx, under direct laryngoscopy, assistant to this identifies the guide wire in the pharynx and grasp it with forceps, pulling the wire through, taking care not to pull the distal end of the wire through the needle. Uh, the easiest way to kind of solve this is to take a pair of forceps or hemostats and clamp on to the distal end of the wire so you, it doesn't go all the way through the needle. Um, Pretty much using this uh, catheter at this point, slide the catheter over the proximal end of the assistant's hand of the guide wire into the airway, advancing until resistance is felt. So in this part here, we're going to actually put uh, our ET tube over the guide wire, and we're going to introduce it and pull slightly up. Now this is going to position the guide wire in place with the endotracheal tube so that it should slide right into the glonic opening. Advance the endotracheal tube over the guide catheter into the airway until resistance is met. While holding the endotracheal tube firmly, remove the clamp on the guide wire at the needle and pull the guide wire and the guide catheter through the patient's mouth. Advance the endotracheal tube to the proper depth in the trachea and then secure the endotracheal tube and confirm proper placement. And this is kind of the procedure here and some pictures. We do have a skills video of this on the blackboard. So we used a 14 gauge angiocath to introduce a needle with a catheter into the cricothyroid membrane. We introduced a central line stylet or guide wire into there and threaded it into the oropharynx. Under laryngoscopy, the person grabs this and continues pulling it on out the mouth. So you have this wire that's going from here to here. A good thing to do at this time is to clamp so that this thing can't, you can't pull the wire all the way out of the oropharynx or the opening of the mouth. Once we got that guide wire in place, pulling a little bit of tension in this direction, we place an ET tube over the guide wire and this ET tube is going to essentially be used and guided into the glottic opening. Um, once we have that in that position, hold onto this ET tube very securely and remove the guide wire in this direction. Now what that's going to do is, is that's going to be in the tracheal opening and there's not going to be a stylet in this. And if we'll put just a little bit more pressure on it at that point, It'll go down and seat to the appropriate depth, inflate our balloon, and check for proper ET2 placement. This ends part one. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Name's Roy Smith. Uh, these are the two email addresses that are going to be the easiest for you to contact me at r.roy.smith at redlandcc.edu 
or smithr at imsa.net. Thank you.